Hello, everybody, and um, welcome to our first season of the Your Voice is Your Power podcast. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you today. Uh, my name is Jasmine Taylor. I am the sales manager for our Active Minds speakers. Um, and at Active Minds, we are the nation's premier organization for mobilizing youth and young adults around mental health. Um, just to give you an idea of what we have going here, um, the Your Voice is Your Power podcast is a series by Active Minds um, where we'll focus on mental health advocacy. This means advocacy on all levels. Um, so in your school, in your community, and even advocating for yourself. Um, each season of this podcast will focus on a distinct demographic and mental health advocacy topic. And today's topic that we'll be focusing on, um, more so this season, we'll be focusing on Black women's self-care and advocacy. So before we kind of get into everything and I introduce you to our lovely guest, Avi, um, we do want to just set a quick stabilization um, of what our why is. And um, I will start off with a quote from B. Atkins Jackson from 2020, where they say, there is a need for a definition of self-care for Black women that includes the role of structural and external factors and requiring self-care as survival. Additionally, there is a need for empirical research that connects the dots in the literature from intersectional oppression to self-care practice. And furthermore, there is a need for delineated self-care practices for Black women to engage that improve health. Um, so as you digest that, I do want to take a moment um, just to get us started and introduce um, Dabi Ibebo. Um, Dobby is a recent NYU graduate who is part of the 2023 National Active Minds, Your Voice is Your Power Student Advisory Board. And on this board, um, Dabby came up with the idea and blueprint for the first season of the podcast. So welcome, welcome, welcome. And thank you, first and foremost. Hi, thank you for having me. Hi. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing the space. Um, now, as I said, Debbie actually created the idea for this podcast first season. So that being said, um, I just want to know what um, inspired you to create a podcast that focused on Black women's self-care. So I came up with this idea or I decided to go with this idea because I wanted to create something that specifically addressed the needs of Black women in mental health and knowing my perspective as someone who was raised as a Black woman and also seeing the research on how little information and resources are out there for Black women and mental health specifically, I wanted to create something that allowed us to have those conversations. And I wanted it to be something that was more personal and more engaging and something that was kind of open and created a space for a lot of different people with different backgrounds as Black women, a lot of different Black women from different parts of the world and different ethnicities and different experiences to come and talk about their experiences with mental health and bring more exposure to the need for uh, tailored mental health resources and information for Black women. So yeah, that's why I decided to go with this project. Yeah, I love it. I love the idea of it. And I love that you were able to come into the space to do so. Um, and I just love being part of it, clearly. But um, thank you so much. Um, so as we kind of um, dive deep into the discussion today, we'll start off with um, your personal self journey. Um, so can you share a bit about your personal self journey um, with self advocacy for your mental health and self care as a black woman? Sure. So I am Nigerian. I grew up in Nigeria. And in this context, growing up, mental health was not a conversation that was had. It was very stigmatized, very demonized. So it was very difficult for me to recognize and even name the things that I was going through or understand what the help I needed was. And then leaving Nigeria and going to school abroad, going to Abu Dhabi, going to New York, I finally was getting the knowledge and the information, but that knowledge wasn't very tailored to my experiences and it wasn't enough to give me the tools to support my mental health and advocate for myself because it was very limiting in my experience I 
could not see myself in the conversations that were being had. And through my undergraduate experience, I started working a lot on campus and working in student advocacy positions, advocating for mental health, advocating for student services. And through that process of learning how to advocate for other people, I started to internalize that, learn how to advocate for myself as well. I was in an environment with people from several different backgrounds. So it was important for me to make sure that everybody was getting the care that they needed and the support that they needed from the school in ways that reflected their personal experiences. And through those experiences of student leadership, I realized how much I wanted to dedicate myself to creating spaces where people can advocate for themselves and people can see themselves in the mental health resources that are offered. And it reflected very much on my own mental health journey as well. I started getting the language I needed to seek help and to just care for myself in a better way because I was able to combine the theories and resources available for mental health with my cultural and personal experience as a Black person, as a Black woman. And it was for the first time um, relevant and contextual, and it was supportive. And I wanted to do that for other people as well, which is why I decided to work with Active Minds on the Your Voice, Your Power board and to create resources and do research that supports BIPOC individuals, supports queer individuals and people who are not generally seen or represented in the research and in the resources. And that's kind of where I see myself and my career going is just continuing to help people and in turn helping myself because at the end of the day, a lot of mental health is very community-based. We're all kind of talking and having conversations and supporting each other. And through those conversations, we're learning more. And I think that's something that's very important to me through my advocacy journey was being able to talk to people and being able to share experiences and get context and support that I needed through that community. So that is, I guess, my journey with self-advocacy. And it's still an ongoing journey because none of this is linear at all. So sometimes there's highs and lows, and sometimes it's more difficult to find the space to advocate, and sometimes it's not, but it's ongoing, and it's um, very relevant, and it's been very helpful. I love that. I love that. And I love um, just to circle back and like save space for this, that main piece where you mentioned how it is not linear. Um, I think that a lot of times as we're doing things and we're doing this work, um, we start to say, oh, you know, it's, it's going to be the same or it's going to be consistent. It's going to be this and that. Um, so really taking the time and space to highlight that I think is really important. Um, and thank you so much for putting, that's a lot of work to put in. That's like physical work <laughs> and self-work at the same time. So I really do appreciate your passion and your effort for that. Um, and really kind of going through the trenches on that piece. I can only imagine trying to study and do that at the same time is a lot. Yeah, it's a um, lot. <laughs> I believe in it. So in, in, what, in what ways do you think societal perceptions or stereotypes of black, about Black women impact their ability to prioritize um, their self-care or even seek support um, for their mental health when needed? I think this is a great question and it's something that I guess in these conversations it comes up a lot especially one stereotype I'll call to is the perception of black women as supposed to be strong and capable of overcoming anything and because of that perception a lot of black women just push through and push through and push through without really talking about these things because they don't want to be seen as weak they don't want to falter in their strengths and I think that's something that's very difficult to overcome and it it makes it very difficult to seek support and seek help and it forces black women to kind of invalidate their own experiences and silence themselves and then also I would point to the to misogynoir in spaces in general and in living in general Mm -hmm. and how difficult it is to seek help and support when you are being constantly invalidated by the people you are trying to seek help and support from. So 
for instance, going to therapy and you're working with someone who is a white man, for instance, and cannot understand your experiences or respond to your experiences in a way that is validating and that becomes very difficult for black women to validate their own experiences and understand their own experiences and seek help for them and I think these are situations that are have been ongoing for ages and in recent times it's been getting better I think the more we talk about mental health the more people kind of destigmatize it for themselves the more people have the language and can validate their experiences but it is very difficult for black women in society that are facing these structural and systemic system I'm gonna rephrase that that are facing these structural and systemic problems to navigate the health experience I mean research shows that black women find it much harder than any other demographic to get diagnoses and to get support and so it just deters people from seeking support and from seeking help and that's why it's important for us to continue to have these educate these conversations it's important for mental health practitioners and mental health resources to continue to stay educated on the needs of black women and the needs of black people in general and it's important for us to destigmatize mental health in a way that is culturally relevant and it is um I guess culturally responsive and aware and not shaming black people for their experiences or not shaming black people for their lack of knowledge but instead contextualizing the knowledge you're trying to give for this community. Very much agreed. Very, very much agreed. I think that that's one of the that shame piece, again, just dropping gems, dropping gems. <laughs> um, that shame piece is definitely um, one of the main pieces that it's like, you can, don't be ashamed, go ahead and ask for help when you need it. And that community piece, which really is a basic. I, again, love the highlight of it, love the mention of it um, and the thought that was put in there too. Um, so if you're looking, um, at other identities, um, of yours and that intersect with the identity as black woman, that affects your mental health. Well, better yet, I will rephrase the question. Um, in what ways do other identities of yours intersect with your identity as a black woman and affect your mental health? So intersectionality. Intersection, that's my favorite word. I love intersectionality. I could talk about right? intersectionality all day. <laughs> so level, um, first level. <laughs> it's 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 a um, we need to talk about it. It's um yeah, yeah, so the first thing I would talk about, I guess, is my identity as a queer person and being gender non-conforming, but also having been socialized as a black woman and having experienced the world as a black woman and continue to experience the world as a black woman, that's still an identity that is very integral to my being. But then being queer mm -hmm. and having um, experiences with gender dysphoria, those are things that have exacerbated my mental health um, state or condition and have made it difficult to understand and navigate how to help myself, how to advocate for myself and how to seek support. Um, the experiences of Black queer women and Black queer um, gender expansive people are very rarely documented and very rarely looked at in research. So it becomes very difficult to know how to navigate these spaces or know how to contextualize and understand what these things would look like for me and I guess I, I won't say that I know all the answers now or I have learned everything now which is why like I said it is an ongoing process of learning and trying and seeking support and community and resources I think it's important. I found through my journey and my experience the need for queer resources that call to the needs of Black queer people and the experiences of Black queer people, which are unique from the experiences of other queer people, of Asian queer people, of white queer people. All of these are very unique experiences and all of these need to be highlighted in mental health 
resources. And I don't see that is very important to me and integral to my experience as being Nigerian and being outside of Nigeria as a Nigerian and experiencing mental health issues and navigating mental health advocacy through that experience. Being an international student and an immigrant to the US, my experiences as a Black woman were different from experiences of African American women and other Black American women in the US. And seeking resources and help, it was difficult to navigate the, I guess, contextual differences. For instance, Nigeria is a very community centered society. And in America, it's a lot more individualized or the way um, interactions are a lot more individual. And that's kind of the difference, I guess, between not just America and Nigeria, but I guess the West and non-Western societies and cultures. And that kind of came up in my interactions with people and in the conversations I was having. So people had different perspectives on what self-care would look like in that sense, because self-care for me was very community centered. It was very much about coming together and supporting and giving resources and mutual aid. And in con in the other context, it wasn't. It was more about the individual, the personal things that you can do for yourself and by yourself. So navigating what self-care would look like for me was kind of difficult um, with those two different identities in hand. And I guess it points to the fact that Black women are not a monolith and Black women exist in so many different spheres and cultures and experiences. So having mental health support that is specific and also just contextual and open to context and open to nuance is something that is I found was very relevant for my experience and I find is relevant for experiences in general. It's just being able to have nuanced conversation and not having like set ideas on what self-care could look like generally, but instead being able to transform mm -hmm. those ideas into different contexts. And as a Nigerian, it was very hard for me to kind of marry certain things in mental health versus my upbringing and my experiences as a Black woman versus other Black women's experiences. But I mean, I find, like I said, like conversation and community are at the center of healing for me and being able to have those different experiences or have other Black women tell me their experiences. I had a lot of friends from the Caribbean, a lot of friends from the US, a lot of friends from different parts of the world that were experiencing different things as Black women. And being able to have those conversations was very helpful for my growth and for just giving me more perspective on what mental health and self-care advocacy could look like. I love that, especially paying attention to the fact that giving everyone the space to really define what self-care is for them. Um, I think that's so important as well. So to continue to do that yet again, just knocking them out here. Are there... Are there cultural or community specific practices um, that you find particularly helpful in maintaining your mental well being? So, uh, as you mentioned, community. So, when you're looking at that, what, what does that look like and kind of, you know, what does that definition look like for you? Uh, this community is something, especially this year, is something that I've been thinking about a lot on what can community look like and how can we be community to each other? And in just getting through the pandemic and getting through these very difficult periods of my mental health and the mental health of society at large, the importance of support and mutual aid and um, shared spaces is something that was very important to me in having a shared space that I could be in and talk to people and just have companionship and, um, shared, I guess, understanding and care and compassion. And something else actually that I would consider the cultural um, rendition of my self-care practices is also like the infusion of music and dance in my self-care and movements and just having been encompassing that livelihood of 
music and dance in black culture and in my mental health so for instance i listen to music a lot i listen to music on these headphones a lot like 24 7 and i don't just listen to i guess um what would generally be the soft kind of relaxing mindful i also listen to very upbeat afrobeat music and i'm always dancing and moving around and that's for me is one of my greatest forms of self-care is just being able to dance and move around and have a good time and listen to music that makes me feel energetic and makes me feel alive and makes me feel uh, like a part of something bigger than myself and so I would really point to that as what self-care is for me like I just just get up and dance get up and move I remember at the beginning of the year Mm -hmm. I like into my crossover into the new year I just put on some music and I was dancing around for that entire night and it was the most like freeing experience it was so fun it was so and it was just me in my room by myself like there wasn't anyone else there I was just dancing and having a great Mm -hmm. time and it was it felt renewing it felt like mindful as well and I really really would like love to share that with people it's just being able to move and have a good time is a great form of self-care. I love that. I love that. So you can be on my side for the debate of me breaking into song constantly. No one else understands it. Um, you so, should. You have to break into song. That's just a part of, it's a part of life. <laughs> How do you navigate discussions about mental health within your family or your community? So when you're in these spaces, um, and of course, hearing you say like your own way of navigating what your self-advocacy looked like in your mental health and well-being, when you had to bring that conversation to your community or just down to certain family members, anything of that sort, um, what was pretty much your tactic or your best practice for navigating those discussions around mental health? I think my best practice or what I found through this process was just having compassion and kind of easing people into it because I know that this people were not raised to have these conversations and they don't have as much awareness as I do about these conversations and as much as I don't want to be their sole educator for this because I'm also going through things and would like support I recognize that but I also recognize that it is a learning curve and it's a learning process so what I try to do is be compassionate and give as much as I can in a way of sharing my experiences and sharing the experiences of people in general and educating and then also being careful to validate myself and to hold people accountable as well like I can give you this much information I can give you everything it's up to you to go ahead and learn more and to in like really take in this knowledge and use it so I try to keep that balance between having all that compassion and also being aware of myself and being compassionate to myself as well because I'm also a person that's deserving of compassion from me so being able to validate myself and being able to take a step back where I need to if this is a conversation that's not going anywhere I can take a step back I can do what's best for me and then I can go again if I feel like if not that's okay as well because at the end of the day you are important and you are valid and you deserve whatever you need to live your best life in my opinion so these conversations with family and community especially coming from a very stigmatized area they're very difficult and it's not going to look the same for everyone so I wouldn't I personally wouldn't advise or like I mean who am I to advise but anyways I personally wouldn't um tell anyone how to talk to their family or how to talk to people because I know that people are coming from very different contexts and there's also questions of safety and there's questions of um, just being aware of what the any outcome could be of these conversations so just 
prioritizing taking care of yourself and protect yourself and be aware of what the conditions are that you're in and be aware of um validating yourself and your experiences and the most important thing in these conversations with family and with community are that you are safe and you are getting help and you are finding support because that's what these conversations should be for so personally i have gone through stages of figuring out how to have these conversations and over the last couple of years it has changed significantly and not only in my personal interactions with family but just in the community at large and like nigeria and the space conversations around mental health have changed significantly and more people are especially like younger kids are able to talk about what they're going through and young black girls are able to share their experiences and confront family members and talk about the things that they're going through so it is a process especially when you're beginning that process and you're kind of the first person to have that conversation it's always very difficult to have it but um I think it's worth it it definitely is it definitely is and I I do appreciate creating that space for um the conversation around boundaries and self-validation uh Sometimes getting in these conversations, we forget those two pieces because we want to help so much. Um, so thank you for validating yourself in those spaces and having your boundaries um, and, and just making sure you're in a safe space when trying to really make sure those conversations happen within your community or with your family members. Um, so if you have to, um, looking at like your mental health needs or advocating for um, Black women advocating for themselves, what advice would you offer to other Black women who may be struggling to prioritize their own mental health needs or advocate for themselves? I think the first thing I would say is that every experience is unique and every experience is contextual. And if you're experiencing something and it doesn't look like how someone else is experiencing it, but you're questioning and you think you need help, but you're not sure, it's always best to just talk about it and ask someone and to validate those experiences, even if they don't look like it might look for someone else. It's for Black women, especially experiencing mental health concerns, a lot of Black women are high functioning, which means that they're capable of doing a lot while they're going through a lot of things. And because of that, they don't seek a lot of care because they don't think they need it because they are going to work and going to school and doing all the things they should be doing. But if you feel Mm -hmm. like there's something going on and you're not sure, always ask for help and always talk about it and if you feel even while you're high functioning even while you're doing all these things you still need support you deserve that support and you should be able to get that support and it's always difficult to advocate for yourself when you're a person who looks like they have everything put together which is the case for a lot of black women and why a lot of black women don't get the diagnoses that they're looking for I would say keep pushing and keep fighting to have your voice heard and to have your experiences seen. And yeah, the main thing is always to talk and talk to people, find people in your community and just have those conversations. There's a directory for queer therapists of color, the National Queer and Trans Therapists of Color directory in the United States. And I think it's a great resource for finding people who would be able to help you validate those experiences and navigate those experiences, especially as Black queer women and Black queer gender nonconforming individuals having mental health care practitioners that look like you and sound like you and have the experiences you have is always a really great bonus to being able to advocate for yourself. So definitely use that directory and find someone to talk to. I think, yeah, having someone to talk to is where it's at. Yeah. So last but not least on my little questions, Um, How do you see the role of self-advocacy and self-care 
are evolving within the broader conversation around mental health and wellness for Black women? I think with the conversations we're having now with resources like this, I think it's only going to become better and broader. I mean, conversations were being had and research was done for Black women in the past, and it's going to continue growing as we keep talking more about the different facets of Black womanhood and the different experiences, especially of marginalized women and queer individuals within the community. I think as more research grows, the conversations will become more natural and more fluid and advocacy will become so much easier. I, um, maybe because of the person I am, I'm just very big on research and having the data, having the information there so that people have access to it. And I think the more that research grows, the more the data grows, the more we look for data for Black women in mental health and self-care, the easier it would be for Black women to understand their experiences and shape self-care for themselves. And I'm very grateful for just the way um, we are starting to have more conversations in society about mental health and starting to have more conversations about identity and the differences in identity and the ex- how expansive identity is and how much that impacts your experiences in the world. And it's such a difficult world to navigate right now, but because we're having all these conversations, it's becoming so much easier for people to advocate for themselves and people to recognize that they need to advocate for themselves. And I think that's a fantastic thing. So hopefully the research grows, hopefully more people and more people in authority, more practitioners and leaders of organizations and more people in the society and educators as well are talking about this as well and having these conversations as well like everybody should be talking about this and at all levels of society so that people can advocate for themselves your educators and practitioners can advocate for you your policy officers can advocate for you everybody should be having these conversations and that way it grows and affects even you know the smallest person true story everybody emphasis on everybody um, so when we're looking at self-care and the things that we do for ourselves, the advocacy piece, I always say pampering myself um, is always my first little niche on the board. Um, do you have uh, any like, I know you said you love music. So do you have um, any particular song, poem or book or anything like that, that just really kind of grounds you or on a bad day gives that little piece of sunshine just to make it better? Yes. So I'm going to give two songs because they're two different songs. So one is Know That You Are Loved by Cleo Soul. It's such a beautiful, it's so beautiful. I just, it's such a beautiful song. It's like a mantra, a little affirmation to say over and over and over again. And it just brings me so much peace. It's amazing. And then the second one, I guess, doesn't it's not really an affirmative song, but I, it just makes me so high energy and I love it so much. It's called Soka Kingdom. It's a Caribbean song, it's Soka, and it's it's just so fun. It's fantastic. And I love the genre of Soka because it's very jump up and get up and dance and wave your flag and have a fantastic time. So that's my second song. I, whenever I listen to that, I just, I can't be sad. I just have to get up and wave my flag. I don't know. So <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's like, it's like a calm vibe, but then carnival on the other side. Mm-hmm. I'm not mad at it. Please need balance. Makes me so happy. We need balance. Yes. <laughs> really? Really? So we are going to, before we wrap up, I want to do a quick little mindfulness exercise. Um, Can I teach it to you really quickly? It's real easy. Yes. Yes, you can. Okay. Um, So box breathing. It's one of my favorite things to do throughout the day. 
Um, and just as we're walking through, say you're having a stressful day, anything of that sort, um, box breathing, I, I do this in between meetings at my desk in front of people and they don't even know I'm doing it. <laughs> so um, we're gonna go through um, step by step. It's four easy steps. Um, so step one, you breathe in and counting count to four slowly as you breathe in. Step two, is to hold your breath for four seconds. So I'll count down for you. And step three is to ex exhale um, through your mouth for four seconds. And then you repeat those steps until you feel centered. I love that. So essentially it's like a little box. Um, so hopefully that's a good um, little takeaway just for any other time when you're feeling overwhelmed, stressed, or just today ain't the day. Like just plainly, this, this is not the day. Yeah. Um, just as you said, remembering to breathe, that, that little burst of oxygen just usually helps calm yeah. me down. And then I end up singing my song. Um, but thank you so much, Dabby, for taking the time, the space, the energy um, to join us today and really start off this podcast with your vision. Um, I'm so excited that you are here to really um, push this conversation and um, continuing your research and your passion um, for really connecting our community to uh, mental health overall, but especially in the essence of defining what self-care um, and community and mental health look like for Black women. Um, kudos on the journey. So excited. Um, and I would love to have updates of your research um of course. but overall um thank you everyone else as well for joining us today um also as just a quick plug um if you want to give us feedback on the podcast or this podcast episode please check out our survey in the notes we would love to hear um your thoughts anything that you think was great, we would love to hear, but also if there's anything that you would like for us to bring to the conversation in the future, please let us know. As we said, talking is key. Um, so feel free to check out that link in the survey and we look forward to you tuning in next time. Thank you so much, Dabby, and truly appreciate you. Thank you, it's been so lovely to have this project manifest and it's so lovely to be a part of it.